Well, let me first uh, thank Klaus and his group for hosting me this week and making me feel so very welcome. Um, and also to the other institutions you mentioned who are uh, sponsoring this talk for having me here today. Um, I also want to acknowledge my co-authors in this work, uh, Bruno Lantz, uh, who is now at the University of Neuchâtel, and Tim Swanson, who's at the Graduate Institute Geneva. And lastly, I want to thank you for choosing me over the sunshine. Um, I hope I don't let you down over the next couple of hours or hour and a half, whatever. <laughs> don't worry. It's not that long. Well, we'll see. So, so this talk is about the continued massive expansion of the global population and whether we could actually f sustain that population, whether we could feed it. Now, this, isn't, this has not been, as, as Klaus mentioned, my career's work. Um, whatever reputation I have, I suppose, is, is in the economics of climate change. So after my PhD, the first job I had was to work for Nick Stern when he was uh, the uh, chief economist at the UK Treasury on his book, The Economics of Climate Change. And my specific job was to estimate the cost of climate change, uh, which we estimated to be 5 to 20% of global GDP now and forever. So uh, having uh, got used to building small models of very big problems, uh, more recently I've been attracted uh, with the help of my colleagues Bruno and Tim to build a, another small model of a different big problem. Um, and of course uh, we are by no means the only people to address this issue so actually my talk will partly be a summary and reinterpretation of work done by others including most probably some people here on modelling global land use and agriculture uh, and also uh, describing to you our new work and how I think that contributes. So just to, uh, to give you a sense of what's coming, so uh, I'm going to, in the first section, just describe the problem we face. Um, and then I'm going to describe our particular take on it. Um, now, as I said, we're not the first uh, people to think about whether a growing global population can be fed. In fact, you could trace the interest in this at least as far, ba as far back as Thomas Malthus, who was writing in the 18th century and whose ideas we st are still relevant today. Um, but um, I think what's distinctive about our approach is that it's uh, explicitly macroeconomic. So what we're trying to do is to integrate some ideas from modern macroeconomics and, and bring it to an issue which has been modelled, in, in my view, in a somewhat disparate way. What I mean by that is that our model is going to jointly determine population economic growth and the production of food. So it's not the case that we'll take somebody's forecast of population and work out whether we can feed it, or take somebody's forecast of food production and work out whether the population, what population we get. We want to model all those things together and see what insights it gives us. And now the next bit is interesting to me because I suppose my, my climate change modeling might belong on towards the catastrophist end of the spectrum. So I was somewhat surprised, and perhaps pleasantly surprised, to find out that our modelling of this issue turns out to be relatively optimistic. You might call it Panglossian, after Pangloss, who was the, 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 uh, the character in Voltaire's novel Candide, who was prone to optimism. So it turns out that our model, while having a fundamentally Malthusian mechanism at the heart of it, delivers a Panglossian conclusion. Or does it? Um, because there are, of course, as with any model, a lot of important things it leaves out. And so it would be remiss of me not to go through these issues at the end and try to contextualise the modelling and uh, explain to you how I think everything might actually go wrong. I wouldn't be a fully paid-up Scotsman if I didn't finish on a negative note after all. <laughs> uh, and that will be my conclusions. OK, so let me start with context. So... The first observation I want to make is that in historical perspective, we're living through a population explosion. Um, when we look at population forecasts for the rest of this century, we're, visually we're used to seeing them start at 2000 or 2017. Uh, that's at one side of the axis and 2100 at the other end of the axis. But I find it actually quite helpful to stick that on the end 
of a time series which starts at the year 1000. And you can really see how much the global population has exploded since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution and how much it's pro projected to continue increasing. So um, the global population crossed the 7 billion barrier at some point in about the middle of 2011. And in fact, as, 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 as recently as 1998, it was still under 6 billion. So if you think about it, it only took 12 to 13 years for the global population to add a billion. Um, going back to 1950, the global population was about 2.5 billion, and in 1850, it was about 1.3 billion. And it increased apparently by only a billion over about 1,000 years prior to that. So we're living through a population explosion. What about the future? Well, if, if we go by the United Nations projections, which are almost hegemonic in this field, I would say, then they suggest that by the end of the century, the global population might be anywhere between 9.5 and 13.3 billion, with a central estimate of something like 11.2 billion people. So we're going to be adding another perhaps 4 billion people to the global population between now and the end of the century. Now, this raises many important questions, but one of them, I think, is, well, could we feed so many people? And I want to start considering this question by thinking about how these population projections are actually derived. Now, demo demographers make population projections predominantly based on the so-called cohort component method, which is an economist I understand to be an accounting identity. It says that the population this year is the same as the population last year, plus the number of people that were born last year and have survived, less the number of people that died last year. And demographic forecasts are detailed and sophisticated, and what they tend to do is to, base, is to make projections of births and deaths based on extrapolating the past with varying degrees of sophistication. So the question is, what role does food, the availability of food, play in making a population projection? Well, the answer is actually it plays no particular role. And I think, I want to say I think that's fine. I'm not criticising demographers. I think the beauty of the cohort component method is its, is its simplicity. And uh, you, one could not reasonably expect demographers to have food availability at the centre of their calculus. Nonetheless, the, the only role that, that food would play in a, an exercise of extrapolation like this is implicit. So insofar as uh, food has, been, has not been uh, in short supply in the past, then these projections effectively assume that food will not be in short supply in the future either. And that may indeed be the right answer to this question, but um, I'm reminded of uh, a standard disclaimer that financial advisors, at least in the United Kingdom, are required to put on any uh, pieces of advice they put out, which is that past performance is not necessarily a guide to future performance. In particular, ecologists and ecological economists think of the issue of carrying capacity and worry, worry whether the aggregate scale of the global population while being within the carrying capacity of the Earth to this point may at some point cross that boundary such that the Earth cannot any longer carry it. So I think that uh, there is enough to worry about here to think about modelling population and food in an integrated fashion. Now, as well as the sheer numerosity of the global population in the future, there is another issue we have to keep in mind. And that is that people eat more as they get richer. And this is a robust relationship. And what I'm showing you here is, is from a paper by David Tillman and colleagues in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 2011. They divided a sample of 100 countries in the world into seven groups, seven economic groups from A through G. Uh, group A is the richest countries. That would include the United States and Germany, I imagine. Group G, some of the poorest countries from sub-Saharan Africa. And for each group of countries, they plotted a time series of per capita food consumption from 1961 to 2003. 
So this is a comparison not just between countries, but in the same groups of countries over time. And you can see that the relationship between per capita income on the, on the x-axis and per capita demand for crop calories on the y-axis is tight. This is a very strong relationship. Demand for crop calories goes up as income and living standards go up. OK, it goes up at a diminishing rate, but it still goes up. So the question is, if, 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 if there are going to be more people and people eat more as they get richer, are people going to be richer in the future? Well, now, <clears throat> if forecasting world population in the future is an inexact science, then forecasting the global economy in the future is a famously inexact science. Nonetheless, we do have scenarios at our disposal. And actually, one group of people who have um, may have focused more than perhaps any other on making long-term forecasts of global average income per capita are actually climate change economists. So I went to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report to have a look at a collection of all the reference scenarios that people have made of uh, global GDP per capita, which is what you can see here on the vertical axis normalised to 1 in 2010. And you can see that all of these scenarios, strikingly all of them bar none, expect global average GDP per capita to increase significantly uh, over the course of this century, Why, such that, that by the end of the century it might be something of the order of five and a half times higher than it was in 2010. If rather than making a model-based forecast, we simply extrapolate the trend that held between 1970 and 2010, we still get a global average citizen who has three and a half times as much income in 2100 than he or she had in 2010. So according to a collection of over 100 forecasts by climate change economists, we are certainly going to get richer in the future. I should mention these are scenarios that don't consider what climate change might do to global GDP per capita, but they're fine for my purposes at this point. So, there might be four billion more of us and we're all going to eat more. The question is, can we keep up with that effect on aggregate food demand? Now, so far, world agriculture has actually broadly kept up with the increase in population and the increase in living standards that we have seen. This I always find to be quite an insightful, if slightly complicated chart from uh, a well-known paper by Julian Alston and Philip Pardy in the Journal of Economic Perspectives. It's data for the United States. Nonetheless, it is relatively representative, I believe. These are real prices of a basket of agricultural products over the course of the 20th century. And you can see a significant fall in the real price of this basket of agricultural products, particularly over the second half of the 20th century. Uh, so, and, and this, this is indicative of the fact that uh, uh, food on aggregate became less scarce over the, this, over the course of the second half of the 20th century, less scarce than it was in the first part of the 20th century. Other indicators like the prevalence of undernourishment give you the same kind of pattern. So world agriculture managed to keep up with population explosion and the explosion in living standards after the Second World War. But are we witnessing a slowdown? You can actually observe that to some extent in this chart because you can see that the rate at which this basket of agricultural goods fell in price between about 1950 and the late 1990s slowed and actually since the turn of the millennium real food prices have if anything slightly increased. So is this indicative of a slowdown in agricultural productivity? Well that is what the data suggest. So these are data from another paper by Julian Alston and colleagues from data from the FAO. These are annual average growth rates of, the, of global yields of some of the main crops divided into two categories. First of all, the average growth rate between 1961 and 1990 
and secondly the average growth rate between 1990 and 2007 and you can see in all cases but most notably for the key grain crop wheat uh, the average annual growth rate of yields fell quite markedly. Now another way to plot this uh, result comes from a well-known paper by Charles Godfrey and colleagues in I think it was science or if it wasn't science it was nature it's always one of the two from 2010 where they took this data and they plotted the absolute uh, 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 amount of agricultural production as a function of time. And I think what, what is most evocative about this slide is the time series for the main grains, which uh, are uh, uh, vitally important in this story. You can see that by and large, output of the main grains grew arithmetically or linearly. And as you will all know, arithmetic growth means that the growth rate on an annual basis must have been falling, right? So the idea that average annual yield growth fell is consistent with this idea that uh, absolute production grew only arithmetically. If you look at the coarse grains, they did even worse. They grew sub-arithmetically, if you like, and while the root crops appear to have grown slightly better than arithmetically, they grew slowest of all uh, for most of that time. So I don't know about you, but looking at this slide really evokes Malthus to me. Okay. Because back in 1798, when Malthus was thinking about whether population could be a check on, uh, sorry, whether food availability could be a check on population growth, he, he realized what could happen if arithmetic growth in food availability was superimposed on exponential growth in population. As he wrote, I think it's worth going back to the original text, Taking the population of the world at any number, a thousand millions for instance, the human species would increase in the ratio of 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on, and subsistence as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's arithmetic growth. In two centuries and a quarter, he wrote, the population would be to the means of subsistence as 512 to 10, in three centuries as 4,096 to 13, and in 2,000 years the difference would be almost incalculable, though the, the produce in that time would have increased to an immense extent. So as you all know, Malthus thought that the availability of food uh, could provide a check on population growth. And we've seen from the data over the past 50 years that uh, food production on aggregate has grown arithmetically. Now, of course, population growth hasn't been exponential. It's been less than exponential. And, and that's no surprise because there are many checks to population growth, economic and cultural. We are not, after all, rabbits in Fibonacci's garden. Nonetheless, population did grow more than arithmetically. So it, 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 it leads me to beg the question. Everybody knows Malthus was wrong. Malthus was famously wrong. We always teach his materials and then say, yeah, but he was wrong, and here's Ricardo, and this is why. But as, as, as people, including my benefactor, Jeremy Grantham, have asked recently, is, did he just get his timing wrong? Will he actually be right in the end? And that's one of the things that we want to, to, to try to get at with our work in this area. Now, before I describe our work to you, I think it's fair to acknowledge that uh, it's more than fair. It's clearly fair, fa fair to acknowledge that we are not the only people working in this area. I'm particularly drawn to uh, the suite of global agricultural models. I don't know exactly what to call them, but I'm thinking particularly of the models brought together in the Agricultural Model Intercomparison and Improvement Project and look at what they say on this issue because this, this is actually a, a veritable treasure trove of data on this question. So this slide is uh, taken from uh, a, a special issue of the journal Agricultural Economics in 2014 where they collected together the 10 or so models in the AgMIP project, if you'll permit me to use the abbreviation, which I think is quite neat. And they, they, they used these models to look at uh, issues around global agricultural production and food supply 
over the, the period from uh, the beginning of the, the century to 2050. And what you can see here is the extent to which uh, real prices of uh, agricultural products increase between 2005 and 2050 in a range of models. Now, there are some pessimistic models in here, such as the AIM model, which suggests that real prices could be up to about 40% higher in the middle of the century than they are now. So if you think about that Alston and Pardy chart I showed you, it would constitute a continuation of that recently rising trend in food prices. But most of the model, all the other models, in fact, are, are less pessimistic than that. And some of them actually think that agricultural prices have further capacity to fall in real terms over the first half of this century. The multi-model mean, that's just the simple average of all the models, which any good climate scientist will tell you is an extremely dodgy statistic, but I'm going to use it anyway, suggests that agricultural prices might be about 5% higher by the middle of the century uh, than they are to roughly today in real terms. Now that that, that tends to suggest that Malthus will remain wrong. I mean, that to me just looks like a sort of soft landing in that, uh, that time series I showed you from Alston and Pardee's paper. We just nicely come to a, a situation where agricultural prices are broadly stable in real terms. Why might it be worth looking into this issue further, though? Well, I'll offer you two thoughts at this stage. I'll skip that slide. That's slide just said that uh, the amount of global cropland we might require will go up between about 10 and 25 percent by mid-century. So are we in for a soft landing? Two reasons for caution I'll offer you at this stage. The first one is that the data I showed you are for a so-called reference scenario. There's no climate change in there. And also that study is a few years out of date now. Since then the UN have systematically and successively revised upwards their projections of population growth. Okay. So we now think there'll be more people on the planet in the middle of the century than we thought about five, ten years ago. But the second point, which I think is a bit more fundamental and it's methodological in nature, is that uh, the way these models work, population is, so to speak, exogenous. It's taken from somebody else's forecast for example, from the United Nations. So we have a situation here, if you think about it, where population forecasts are being made by demographers who are assuming that since food wasn't scarce in the past, it won't be scarce in the future. And we have land use modelers taking the same population forecast and putting it into their models to work out whether we can supply enough food to feed that population. So what I'm basically saying to you is that wouldn't it be good if we could try to close this loop a little bit and see how these things move together. And that, I think, is the advantage uh, that a macroeconomic approach uh, can provide. Of course, there are disadvantages too. I want to, to mention those before I go on. The, the AGMIT models are extremely detailed in terms of their regional spatial and resolution and their resolution to different crops. Our model, though you won't really get a feel for this today, is, is, is as, as, as our climate change models are, very aggregated, very aggregated indeed. So really the question we're going to be asking today is whether potentially, globally on aggregate, we could feed 11 billion people. Uh, I don't want to give the appearance of somebody who's not aware of the risk of famines. But what I would say is that uh, since the work of Amartya Sen, we've known that famine is basically a distributional issue. Okay? It's in some sense orthogonal to the question of whether the global agricultural system is producing enough food. Right? The question for famines is, is it getting distributed in a way which can meet everybody's minimum dietary requirements? We won't address that in this work, so the best way to interpret it is not as us saying that nobody is going to go hungry. It's whether the global food system on aggregate could potentially produce enough food uh, to feed everyone. So let me try to give you a little bit more of a flavour of what we're doing here and, 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 and what is, what is uh, new. And I can only provide really a broad sketch uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a setting such as this. So what I'm going to do is basically pay homage to our intellectual heroes in putting together uh, this model. 
Now, the first element, and perhaps the central element, is to model fertility as an economic decision. And to that, we look back to seminal work in economics by Gary Becker and Robert Barrow from the end of the 1980s. Writing in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, Becker and Barrow made a, a very sage observation about the state of the economics of fertility at that time. Their point was this. Uh, models of the economics of fertility have considered that it's costly to produce children, but they haven't connected the preferences that couples have to produce children with their decisions on saving and investing for the future and future dynasties of their own family. And that was a severe limitation in economics at the time because it meant that the, the, the economic theory of fertility couldn't be integrated with the theory of capital accumulation because capital accumulation is fundamentally an intergenerational choice. But if the models don't connect intergenerational choice with fertility decisions, then they're unable to ask important questions such as the relationship between the interest rate and the rate of fertility. So they proposed a model, and I'm going to put an equation there just to show you that there are some. The fundaments of their model is that when, when, when a couple chooses to have a child they think about three things, or, or let me put it perhaps better by saying the utility of parents. And of course, as I'm sure you'll be aware, economists ultimately like to think about decision making in terms of, it, of utility. The utility of a parent depends on three things. It depends on his or her consumption of goods, that's C. It depends on the number of children they have, that's N, but again, to belabor the point, we are not rabbits in Fibonacci's garden. We not, don't only care about the number of children we have, we care about their fortunes. We care about how much utility they will enjoy when they're adults. So we have the basis then for an intergenerational decision where when we're thinking about how many children we shall produce, We've got to be mindful of how, what sort of uh, life we think those children will have. Becker and Barrow wrote down a theory which elegant, elegantly captures that, and we use their ideas in our paper. But this, is, this, this addresses the question of the gross benefit of fertility, if you like. This is why we want to have children. It doesn't address the cost side. For the cost side, we're we are inspired by the work in so-called unified growth theory, most notably by Oded Galore from Brown. These models have, have been a real hit in macroeconomics because they're able to, all in one model, explain not only the pre-industrial revolution period of stagnation, but also population takeoff and the contemporary period of slowing global population. And the key idea in unified growth theory is, or one of the key ideas, is that the cost of rearing children is a function of how much education they need to attain in order to function in the labour market. And as technology improves, children need to be educated more and more to successfully function in the labour market, which makes them more costly to bring up in a broad sense which means that as the level of technology grows, we have fewer children, all else being equal, because they are more costly to bring up, right? Hundreds of years ago, we produced children to work the land. Now we're producing children to work for Facebook. Such children typically need MBAs. Such things are expensive. Okay. And this is going to be an important mechanism in our model because it links technological progress with fertility. And it links it in one direction. It explains fertility as a function of technological progress. But the next idea we want to deal with is the opposite direction of causality, namely that technological progress is a function of fertility. Macroeconomics was in a bad state as far as technological progress is concerned for most of the second half of the 20th century. Uh, the, the, the standard growth model was largely driven by technological progress, but technological progress was manna from heaven. It was an exogenous time trend. It wasn't until the work of endogenous growth theorists like Philippe Aguillon and Peter Howitt in the 1980s and 1990s that economists started to uh, uh, model technological progress 
as a function of, pro of, of directed activities such as research and development. And we'll use this theory in our model so that we can close the loop between fertility and technological progress. <coughs> so our model links the rate of innovation, both in the economy as a whole and in the agriculture sector, to how much labour is allocated to research and development. And of course, research and development can to some extent be a capital intensive process, but for the sake of simplicity, we'll just think about the labour allocation question. By making it incidentally depend on the share of labour allocated to R&D, we avoid our model having a property, an unhappy property of some recent macroeconomic models called the scale effect. That is to say, models which say that the total amount of labour you allocate to R&D uh, drives the amount of technological innovation you get, those models have the unproper, unhappy property that bigger countries should be more innovative. But that doesn't really stand up to the data. More populous countries are not necessarily more innovative. So we neutralize the scale effect in this way. What about agriculture, which of course has a critical role to play uh, in this story? Well, st as, as a standard, we model agricultural production as a function of labor, capital, like uh, farm machinery, and land. But we also model land as a stock which has to be converted from a reserve of natural land and slowly depreciates back into a natural state if it's not uh, subject to, 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 to further cultivation. Okay. And this allows us to uh, uh, address issues such as how much more land does the global agricultural system need if it's going to feed 11 billion people and is there in fact enough land uh, for it to do that. And to close, what, what, do, what in our model is agriculture for? It sounds like an obvious question, but it's actually, it does vary in different kinds of models. In our model, agriculture is just to feed people. Right? We require our population in our model to be fed at all times. It means that overlined F, which is per capita food consumption, times big N, which is the size of the population, has to always be equal to agricultural output, which is big Y, sub AG for agriculture. Technical as this point seems, this is a critical mechanism in our model. This is a second cost of fertility. One cost of fertility is educating children. The other cost of, fertil of fertility is making enough food so that they will survive. We deal with the constraint that the availability of food might have for population by always requiring our population to be fed. I suppose a different model we could have built would produce people who then died of starvation, but this is the way that we deal with it in our model. Okay? So we're dealing with the optimal population on, from the point of view of a household given a food constraint. And we let per capita food requirements increase at a diminishing rate as a function of income. When you put all this together, the model is complicated. <laughs> I don't expect you to follow this flowchart of all the linkages in the model. But I wanted to use it to make a point that I made at the beginning. We are not the only people and certainly not the first people to try to model this relationship between global population growth and global food supply. But what we are trying to do is build a model in which these things are jointly determined. Population is endogenous. Food supply is endogenous. Economic growth is endogenous. And study how this jointly determined system moves forward and ask the question, are we in for a soft landing? So on to the results of our, of our study. According to our model, a global population of in excess of 12 billion people could comfortably be fed by the end of the century. And it could be comfortably fed without ever reaching the constraint provided by all the land on earth that could theoretically be cultivated for crops. So the global agricultural land area expands over the first half of the century, but then hits its own steady state and it does so without ever reaching 
the constraint that I've just described. Why is that? Well, as you might have expected, it, becomes, it, it stems from a fundamentally optimistic story about the future for agricultural technology. Right? Our model projects that agricultural productivity will continue to grow over the course of the century, albeit at a decreasing rate. And these rates that we're looking at here are starting about 1% per year if you look at the left-hand chart and falling to about half of 1% per year by the end of the century are not large compared with productivity gains in the recent past. Nonetheless, that seems to be sufficient uh, to fuel the growth in population. Technological progress in the rest of the economy, which I'll just call manufacturing for convenience sake, it's an increasing misnomer in countries such as this in the United Kingdom that are, 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 are largely service-based these days, but technological progress in the rest of the economy looks a little bit like technological progress in agriculture. Why am I showing you this slide, you might be thinking to yourselves. I'm showing you this slide because it explains why global population keeps on growing through the whole of this century. I said to you that according to unified growth theory, as the level of technology increases, the cost of educating children increases, and so all else being equal, the average couple will have fewer children. And that does happen in our model. But think about not the level, but think about the rate of change. Technological progress is increasing at a decreasing rate. That means the cost of rearing children is increasing, but at a decreasing rate, which means that this mechanism driving the demographic transition perhaps sets in a little bit more slowly than we might have thought. Lastly, we find in line with forecasts from climate change economists that living standards in terms of final consumption per capita could increase significantly, perhaps double, over the course of the rest of the century. So you can see why I decided to call this section a Panglossian conclusion to a model that has a Malthusian mechanism in it. If we look at these results, then we're fundamentally optimistic about the capacity to feed a global population of well in excess of 10 billion by the end of the century. But it is worth, although we can't address it directly in our model at this stage, modelling always in involves difficult decisions about abstraction, it is important to address the question of why the outlook might not be so optimistic. Let me start with one issue which, which appears to be a non-issue. One of the things we did in our, in, in our model was significantly reduce the, substitutability, the assumed substitutability of land in agriculture. We find that has almost, makes almost no difference to the global population at the end of the century and makes but a small difference to the total amount of global cropland uh, that uh, we might see uh, by the end of the century. More troubling is the question of climate change and of course you would expect me to say that as a climate change economist but it does give me the opportunity to try to some extent to tie up two strands of research that I've been involved in. I'll start by looking at the evidence from uh, global agricultural models from the AGMIT project. So, oh, I'm sorry, let me just go back a slide. This slide compares the increase in real agricultural prices over the first half of this century with and without climate change. The blue bars are the increase or decrease in real agricultural prices that might, we might see without climate change in a reference scenario that simply assumes counterfactually that cl the climate isn't changing, a standard tool in modelling studies like this. The red bar introduces climate change and what I've done is I've averaged over a variety of different scenarios used in this study. I think what you can see here is that on average, across the models, agriculture drives global crop yields down and results in agricultural prices in the middle of the century. 
that are higher than they otherwise would be. So that is saying that food is relatively more scarce. But to me, this doesn't look on the face of it like a transformational difference, does it? So the multimodal mean right on the right hand side here says that in a counterfactual reference without climate change, real agricultural prices might be about 5% higher by mid-century. And the same models say that with climate change they might be about 9 or 10 percent higher, but that's still well within the range of historical variation. That if, we plot, if, we, if we backcasted, if you like, that difference of 10 percent, we wouldn't get very far in time. We'd get to about 1980 or something like that. So these models on the face of it appear to be actually relatively sanguine about our capacity uh, to feed the world even under climate change. I think that's reflected also in the, in, in the statements made by the IPCC in its fifth assessment report. It writes, uh, each additional decade of climate change is expected to reduce mean yields by roughly 1%, which is a small but non-trivial fraction of the anticipated roughly 14% increase in productivity per decade needed just to keep pace with demand. And since these models, by and large, show that supply easily keeps pace with demand, then 14% is roughly the rate at which uh, yields are increasing decade on decade. However, IPCC in its inimitable style offers thousands of pages of caveats and I think it's wise to do so. It writes that relatively few studies have considered impacts on cropping systems for scenarios where global mean temperatures increase by 4 degrees centigrade or more. And incidentally, as someone who's worked a lot on, on economic models of climate change, I think that characterises our understanding of the impacts of climate change in almost any sector. We have very few studies of what climate change could do if the global temperature increases by that much. I think, loosely speaking, because we find it hard to imagine what that world would be like, my colleague Nick Stern always likes to invite us to think that five degrees is about the same difference as... as, as, as uh, characterises uh, as holds between today and the peak of the last ice age. So it's a very large environmental change. IPCC also writes that climate changes are expected to result in higher real prices for food past 2050. And this, this um, really helps me to tie together different strands of my own research. Because in my work on climate change, as just a screen capture of a, a paper that I wrote a few years ago in Environment magazine, my work on climate change tends to make the argument that uh, it's, the, it's the tail scenarios, if you like, the worst case scenarios that we should really worry about, that those worst case scenarios are extremely bad, and that even if they're not very probable, they weigh significantly in our minds when we integrate over, the, 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 over the, the range of things that could happen and how likely they are. And I think it would, be, it would be incoherent of me not to apply those ideas to the results that I've shown you in this lecture today. Um, our model is very optimistic about the ability to feed a large global population on a reference scenario. In addition, the, the, the AGMIT models suggest that climate change would not materially affect that picture. But those models only go out to 2050 and they don't include all the mechanisms through which climate change could ultimately be most damaging. So I think that if we are going to worry about the capacity of climate change to affect our Panglossian conclusion, then we should be thinking post-2050 and we should be thinking about worst case scenarios. And I don't doubt, even though I'm not an agronomist, by training that those scenarios are serious. Another issue I wanted to touch on, which I don't think is as serious, but I do think is important to touch on, is biofuels or bioenergy. Models of climate change which uh, analyse how we might cost effectively cut global greenhouse gas emissions by a large amount often, for, often uh, require very large-scale deployment of at least second-generation biofuels like lignocellulosic uh, fuels, things like grasses, 
Doing that on a large scale might require a lot of land. So the question is, is the amount of land that you would have to set aside to do so going to interfere with, our with the need to expand the global cropland area in order to feed a larger population? <laughs> so this chart compares the effect that climate change might have on agricultural prices, which is what you see on the left for five of the AGMIT models, and what large-scale bioenergy deployment might do for agricultural prices, which is what you see on the right for the same five models. So this is a comparison in 2050 between a reference scenario without climate change and without bioenergy and a scenario with climate change and a scenario with bioenergy if you like. Anyway, the key point I think you can see quite clearly is that for most of the models the effect that large-scale deployment of second generation biofuels might have on global food prices is much smaller than the effect of climate change which you will recall from a few slides ago was in itself not apparently transformative. Okay. Why is that? Well, if you actually look at where these models are finding the land to make the second generation biofuels, it is not except for one model coming from cropland or pasture land. It's coming from unmanaged land, natural ecosystems, if you like. But of course that in itself raises some concerns. If we're converting hundreds of millions of hectares of natural ecosystems into bioenergy crops, what will the consequence of that be for biodiversity and ecosystem services? And this is actually the last issue that I wanted to address. And I think it's important, and I, 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 I like to end here because the first paper I ever wrote as an academic was about biodiversity conservation, long before I found myself dropped into the issue of climate change. As you know, we're losing global biodiversity at an unprecedented rate. Uh, some people are moved to describe what we're seeing right now or could be seeing in the near future as a sixth ma mass extinction event, implicitly then with about as much force as when an asteroid hit the Yucatan Peninsula to kill the dinosaurs. Something I think about a lot these days just because I have a four-year-old son who is not a dinosaur but likes them a lot. <laughs> so I wanted to finish. One of the things we wanted to do to our model is we wanted to see what would happen if we put a moratorium on further conversion of agricultural land for crops. We wanted to say to our model, in effect, can you feed a large population if you're not allowed to expand the agricultural system spatially any more than it currently is? And we find that you can, that it makes almost no difference, no discernible difference on this chart to the world population that we might see. Although it may have some impact on consumption per capita and on food consumption because we'll have to di divert an increasing amount of our time into substituting for land in agriculture and also performing research and development in agriculture in order to push productivity up by enough to make up for the fact that we can't have more land. So let me come to some conclusions now. Our model yields relatively optimistic predictions about prosperity and the capacity to feed a large world population. And as a researcher, I don't know what I feel about that. In some ways, I'm, not only is that an encouraging conclusion, but the fact that my previous models in my career have been so pessimistic indicates that maybe it's not just my disposition which is directly carried through to the results of my models and that there's actually something useful to be gleaned from them. So it, maybe it isn't just garbage in, garbage out, but you can form your own conclusions on that. I think that we're, I, I actually think that we're not an outlier in saying so. I, I, that would be the, the, the interpretation I would put on looking at the results of other global models which are methodologically very, very different to ours in some ways. And of course there's a bit of the story here about us taking some of our parameterization and calibration from those models. So I don't wish to give you the impression that they're fully independent in that way. The thing is though that our model generates these projections endogenously using ideas from modern macro. Whatever you think about modern macro, I mean modern macro has a bad reputation, doesn't it? Um, but I'm not trying to forecast financial stability, so maybe it's okay. <laughs>
These predictions don't depend on expanding global cropland area. The, the results I showed you just before the end of the last section suggest that actually they don't depend at all on that. But if there isn't a moratorium on expansion, then global cropland area doesn't grow by very much. Hence the title of the talk, Feeding the World, Leaving the Land, it, Managing to Sustain Growth in Global Food Production Without Expanding the Footprint of Global Agriculture, Literally. And this is all despite a continuing slowdown in the rate of growth of agricultural productivity. So in, in, in some respects, and it's not as simple as extrapolation, but in some respects we are forecasting a continuous, continuation of the trends that I showed you earlier in the talk, and which I suggested were actually a reason to worry. But it does depend on the slowdown itself being slow. I th in some ways, you could think of this as like trying to land a space shuttle. Okay. We're sort of careering towards the future at a very, very, very high speed from a very, very great height. And everything will be fine as long as we can reduce that speed and the angle of our descent slowly enough. Right. Our results appear to be robust to introducing moderate climate scenarios. We don't actually do it in our modelling, but I invite you to take a leap and just think about the orders of magnitude that I've shown you in the rest of the literature and compare it with what's going on in our model. But I think we certainly cannot be sure that it's robust to severe climate scenarios. Nor do I think it is necessarily robust to a, a, what it, you might call a cocktail of linked problems such as biodiversity loss, climate change, limited substitutability of land in agriculture, and so on, because what I've showed you is, is each of these issues in isolation. Um, and that concludes my talk. Um, I hope you found it interesting and I understand now that we're going to have a, a time for discussion and since I think I'm going to stop being videoed I can actually uh, move around and look a little bit less like a politician. So thank you very much for listening. <laughs>